He said it was going to be 32 minutes, and it was, it was exactly 32 <laughs> minutes. Um, it's pretty good that I'm not a respondent to that, because all I could say, if I was, that I agree. <laughs> So, thankfully, we've got some people that are going to say a bit more than they agree. Um, the first person who's going to say something uh, is Ed Miliband, who's now the leader of the Labour Party. Ed had a finely tuned win in the leadership election, <laughs> but he received a huge majority of Compass members when they were balloted about who we should back. And um, Ed says he wants to move beyond New Labour, and all the time he's doing that, he'll continue to have all of the support for <laughs> Compass membership. So. How unconditional. <laughs> Th thank you, I guess. Uh, Neil. Um, <laughs> let, um, look, look, let me start by just saying to David that uh, uh, as someone who's been reading about politics for 25 years or so, I've been always been an incredible uh, admirer uh, of yours, and you are a huge asset to our movement, and I think again tonight you've shown why that is the case. Um, nobody can accuse you of false optimism uh, tonight, uh, but I think it was an incredibly clear and cogent uh, analysis uh, and argument, uh, even if I didn't agree with every single word of it. Let me just make three points in response. I think the first thing to say is I fundamentally agree with the, the central argument that you are making uh, in relation to the market which is that we are at a, I think, a 30-year moment in relation to markets. And it's sort of a 30-year moment that maybe you date back to the 1970s and the crisis of the Labour government uh, in the 1970s, which led to Mrs Thatcher, uh, which then gave way to New Labour, and then the financial crisis of 2008. And it, as a sort of point of humility, I would say that I don't think anyone in politics has yet got to grips with the scale and the implications uh, of what that crisis means and the way the crisis means we should rethink. I mean, one thing to just say very clearly is I do not think we should be aspiring to go back to business as usual. In my third point, I'm going to say something uh, about why I think that and what that means. But uh, I don't think we can aspire to uh, simply to business as usual for many of the reasons that you very cogently set out. So that's my first point. The second point I want to make is to somewhat take uh, issue uh, with you, not with that central argument, but I think with, if I may say so, a slightly undue pessimism. Now, I don't consider myself the biggest defender in the Labour Party of the last Labour uh, government at all. I think the, the, where I would take issue with you, and in a way this is important not because I want to particularly defend the past, but because I think it is important for the future and in a way should give us more cause for optimism, is that, just take one example, which was the National Health Service in 1997. People were saying in 1997 a tax-funded uh, health service was simply not something that could be sustained uh, in the modern world that, you know, look at it, it's a crisis service, it's always a, a crisis service, every winter it's a crisis service, people die on health service waiting lists, there's just no way this can be sustained uh, for the future, and there are all kinds of learned people saying you've got to pay, you know, pay for it directly, charges and all of that. Now, the world has changed. Now, I think what Andrew Lansley wants to do to the health service is terrible, and we need to fight it as hard as we can, but there is a reason why... David Cameron, in two, between 2005 and 2010, was saying, look, I'm as big a defender of the health service as the Labour government. I believe in a health service free at the point of use. Things changed. And, and now, you, you know, you are... Uh, you know, reasonable people can absolutely disagree about PFI and other things that happened in relation to our health service reforms, not all of which I dis uh, agreed with, actually. But my son was recently... My second son was recently born in a new hospital in UCH, and nobody was talking about a crisis service. And I think that the reason I mention that, as I say, is not to say everything was great and everything was fantastic, but to say there is a reason for hope. And actually, we won a big argument in 2003 about the need to raise taxes for the health service, and we were the only social democratic government in the last 20 years to do that. And, you know, the Conservatives go around saying, look, they, uh, you know, invested all this money... Uh, in the while they were in government. Now, I don't believe that was the cause of the financial crisis. It goes without saying, 
But it is true that we significantly increase spending on the public realm. Now, you don't like some of the things that we did to the public realm, and I don't like them either, some of them. Uh, I think it is right to say that you need to have uh, accountability in the public realm, and I think it's right to say that some of the targets we did were right, but I think it's also right to say we went too far and the public realm often felt strangled by a sort of audit and, and sometimes a marketized culture. And I agree with that. But I just want to make that second point because I think otherwise we are all going to go away from here thinking, well, we had 13 years of a Labour government and did we really achieve anything or did we just all go backwards? I just want to, to say that. Thirdly, then, what is to be done, which in a way is the most difficult question. I'm glad I'm running out of time. Uh, <laughs> and, no, I'll, I'll, I'm joking. I'll, I'll, say, uh, I'll say three things. Look. First of all, it's a sort of, it's a bit of a sound about this. You've got to limit the market, you've got to reform the state, and you've got to build a movement. And let me just say something about each of those. You've got to limit the market because what we learned over 13 years was that simply having a redistributive welfare state is not enough to run up the down escalator of a, a vastly uh, inequality producing global economy. And you're absolutely right about that. The, uh, the interesting thing about the last Labour government is inequality did go up, but not because it wasn't a redistributive government. It was a very redistributive government, actually. I think by some reckoning the most since 1945, but because uh, inequality was growing so significantly it, at the bottom and at the top, the welfare state couldn't keep up. That's why you've got to have a vision for your politics which goes beyond, if I can put it this way, a Tony Crossland vision which says you essentially grow the economy and you then have a redistributive, redistributive welfare state and then everything will be okay. In a way, we haven't moved on enough from him. Yeah. That's why I'm for a living wage. That's why I'm for action on high pay because actually what you learn is you can't just rely on the welfare state. You're putting too much pressure on the welfare state to create the kind of economy and society you want. It's the first point. Secondly, as David Marquand taught us, never forget reform of the state. Because if we, if we believe that a centralised state, I'm not saying you were making this argument, a centralised state in its current form is either going to convince people or deliver, I think we're wrong. And, you know, I'm for a much more devolved, a much more localised, uh, a, a much more transparent uh, state. I think it is actually an area where we have not done enough work. So... Uh, as a movement, so in a way the choice that is posed is between a privatised state and a marketised state or a, a state that is overladen with targets and audit. And actually, I think we collectively have a big task to develop that alternative vision. It has been talked about for a long time. What does that different kind of state, a more responsive state, uh, look like? Third thing, build a movement. You know, I suppose this is one of the things that I learned most from our time in government, is that pulling the levers can achieve something, but unless you have not just a Labour Party, but a wider movement that supports your cause, you will never succeed in progressive politics in Britain. The Conservatives have their newspapers and have their institutions, uh, but we need much more of a movement than we have. That's why we have to open up our party. That's why we have to be willing to work with uh, other parties. Uh, and that's why we've got to, in a way, uh, abandon some of the other sort of old labour, if I can use that phrase, habits of tribalism, mm. uh, which is, you know, the argument of the progressive dilemma. Because I think unless you recognise that you need a much, much broader uh, movement uh, in your country, then I don't think you're going to succeed. Let me just end on this uh, point, which in a way does talk about libraries, because I think it's interesting. I think that what we are seeing this week in relation to the big society is the intellectual collapse of David Cameron's central idea. Uh, and I think you see it, I think it's just that, that, that tipping point moment when the idea that he has spent five years nurturing has basically collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions. Because people are saying, well, look, it's all very well saying, let me go and volunteer in the library, but if the library is shut, uh, it's going to be quite hard for me to do that. You know, it's all very well saying, you know, help people out with debt advice, but if the CAV's closed, I'm not going to be able to do that either. And as for volunteering to help young kids, if the Shore Start Centre's not there, I'm not going to be able to do that. I think that provides a big, big opportunity for us. Not to say, and Neil and I were discussing this earlier, we're the party of the centralised state, but actually say, look, we are the party that genuinely believes in local communities and local communities making change themselves. And so I think if we... If we 
understand that and understand that we've got to be reformers of the state and build that movement as well as being reformers and limiters of the market, then I think we can build the vision we need. Thank you.